Okay. Uh, my name is Miguel Morales uh, from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Today, we're going to be talking about wave function optimization. So in, in the last day and in the previous uh, lecture, David was mentioning uh, the idea that wave functions in Quantum Monte Carlo are meant to be flexible. Uh, for generic systems, the idea is to put as much physical intuition into the wave function as you can but also to make the wave function as flexible as you can and then use variation of Monte Carlo to get the best uh, variation of solution within the given freedom of your, of your ANSAT, of your wave function. So today we're going to say some things about how this is actually accomplished, uh, in especially in, in the QMC pack package. Uh, in the yeah. So a brief outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'm going to review some of the ideas that David just mentioned. To, to have some of the notation set and, and to refresh your minds. Uh, then we're gonna talk about cost functions, which is what uh, exactly do we want to optimize, what do we want to minimize in particular. And then we're gonna do a brief discussion of optimization algorithms. Uh, what exactly can we do to optimize uh, the cost function and what type of estimators we need to evaluate in Monte Carlo to be able to accomplish this. And finally, uh, at the very end, I'm just gonna say a few specific things about QMC pack. So a very brief review of uh, VMC, Variation of Monte Carlo. So for this lecture, there is no projection. It's all at the variational level. So effectively, all we're doing is doing multidimensional integrals uh, with Monte Carlo. Uh, for the energy in particular, you can, um, for any expectation value in general, you can always uh, write uh, the expectation value as the matrix element of uh, the, the operator with respect to whatever trial wave function you want to consider. And if it's not normalized, of course, you have to normalize it. And this, if you are using simple rules, you can write down as, a, as an integral over the entire configuration space. In this case, R is a 3N dimensional vector with the coordinates of all the electrons in the system, all the particles in the system. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to be electrons. Uh, but for now, let's just assume that this is, this, this is an electronic problem. And uh, if you, uh, so if we skip down here to make it uh, a little bit simpler. So if we define the local energy as the, uh, basically the uh, Hamiltonian apply, uh, being applied on the trial wave function and then divided by the wave function back, you can multiply and divide by the wave function and get a, uh, an integral that looks like this. For now, the average value of the, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian with respect to this trial wave function is just a simple three n dimensional average uh, of the local energy multiplied by the, uh, by, by a distribution function. In the BMC case, this distribution function is just a square modulus of your trial wave function. And of course, normalized. So in principle, to do BMC, all we really need to do is to sample this distribution with one of the methods that David described on the first day. Uh, for example, using Langevin acceleration or just simple metropolis, for example, random moves. And then accumulate values of the local energy along the way. Uh, the variance, which is a very important quantity related to the, to the energy, it's just the expectation value of h minus e squared. And this is a positive definite quantity. And uh, based on the variation, of there, there are two important things to notice. So the, the, the fact that the VMC is a uh, variation of principle means that the energy that you obtain, that you obtain is a rigorous upper bound to the true energy of the system. This means that for any wave function that you can consider, anything you can write down in any form, as complicated as it can be, the energy would always be higher than the true exact energy of the system. And it is only exact if the wave function is exact also. So if you're lucky to find a wave function, uh, if, if you're in some, somehow able to write down the exact wave function, you know that using this procedure, you can exactly sample the exact uh, energy of the system. It also has a, what's called a zero variance principle, which means that the variance of the exact wave function is zero. This means, and since the variance is a positive definite quantity, uh, the variance of any approximate wave function has to be positive and non-zero. It is only zero for the exact energy, for the exact wave function. So we have right here two principles that we can use to find better and better solutions for uh, a, a given system. We either minimize the energy because we know that the exact solution is the, the absolute lowest energy that you can have doing this procedure, or we minimize the variance. They don't necessarily have to coincide, and, and I'm going to say a little bit more about this later on. Wave function optimization, a, a few words about it. So I haven't uh, have been in this field for several years, but I have been told that in the 90s, this used to be a very problem, problematic uh, exercise and time consuming. 
maybe David, David can say a little bit more about this. Uh, so I, I hear this, this typical comments that back in the, in the 90s, you know, an entire thesis, it, it would take a student years to be able to optimize wave functions for a given system. Wow, that's maybe a little bit uh, too over the edge, but, uh, but it, it basically uh, the idea of having robust uh, tools to optimize wave functions were not really available maybe 15 to 20 years ago. This is not the case anymore. Uh, so not only in QMC pack, but also in, in all the other uh, QMC packages uh, available, optimization in the last five or six years have gone through a, a, a bit of a revolution and now we have really robust uh, algorithms. It's possible to optimize hun uh, hundreds and thousands of parameters on really complicated wave functions and in a very straightforward and with almost no human uh, intervention at this point. In particular, the linear method is the one that I'm going to focus on later on, and, and this has been uh, one of the best, uh, you know, introductions in, into the optimization uh, technology, I would say. So QMC can use complicated wave functions. That's one of the benefits of the method. If, if, you, uh, if you have any experience, for example, in, in quantum chemistry methods, where you really attempt a solution of the problem, uh, the typical wave functions that you can consider are typically either linear combinations of determinants, or some sort of exponential uh, propagate, uh, sort of some sort of exponential operator on the wave function, like couple cluster methods, and they the wave function has to intrinsically be composed of combinations of things that are uh, non-interacting in nature, in determinants. If they have wave functions where the there is a dependence on two electrons at a time, the the need for m very high dimensional integrals makes the, these typical wave functions not useful. In, in quantum chemistry methods. I, in Monte Carlo, this is not the case. In Monte Carlo, if you can write it down and if you can evaluate it on a machine, basically that's all you need. Yeah. So I'm gonna say in a, few, if in a few slides, you need to evaluate three quantities out of a wave function. And if you can do those in a machine, then you can do variational and diffusion Monte Carlo on them. Uh, so the typical strategy uh, that's followed whenever you have a, a problem is, well, first you start with the simplest solution that you can do. You, you do this what's called a slater gesture. That's typically considered best practices. You take your slater determinant from a mean field system, let's say DFT, with your favorite uh, exchange correlation functional. You optimize with variation of Monte Carlo a standard gesture function, which would have something like one and two body terms, let's say. And then you see what the energy is. If the energy is not accurate enough and this system is important enough, then you go back to the beginning and you add complexity to the wave function. Maybe you throw in a, a few extra determinants. Maybe you try to optimize the orbitals. But basically, you, you go around, and each time you you're done with the calculation, if you're not satisfied with the accuracy, you can always go back and make your wave function a little bit more complicated. So like I just mentioned, yeah, let me say a little bit about what type of parameters we typically have in a, in a wave function. The standard wave function, the, the simplest form that we use, and by far the one that most calculations use, is a slater gesture form. So this contains a, an anti-symmetric piece and a, and a gesture correlation. And David has, has mentioned this already in the few slides, so this is just meant to be reviewed. So the anti-symmetric term is typically a product of two slater determinants, one for the up spin and the other one for the down spin. Uh, it, in principle, can get more complicated. You can do linear combinations of these, or you can do determinants of geminals, or you can, there's a, a large list of things that have been tried for the anti-symmetric piece. The typical source of parameters in this case are, for example, if you're doing linear combination of determinants, then the linear coefficients become free parameters that you can optimize directly with VMC. Uh, the parameters in your basis set, uh, for example, the Gaussian exponents you could try to optimize, or uh, there's usually contractions over Gaussians. I'm gonna be talking a little bit more actually a lot more about all of this tomorrow when we talk about uh, molecular calculations, but any free parameter in your basis set you can directly optimize. Uh, also, when you get a given solution, let's say the hard to fuck orbitals, uh, that those are gonna be linear combinations of basis sets, so there's gonna be also a lot of sources for free parameters that you can in principle try to optimize and directly optimize the single particle orbital set. In practice, uh, optimizing the linear coefficients in the determinant expansion is very easy. It's probably the easiest parameter to optimize from the entire wave function. Uh, but optimizing directly, so for example, optimizing the Gaussian exponents is uh, it's extremely complicated and very few people attempt it, but it can be done in principle and there's some papers 
by Cyrus Umbrigar doing this, and directly optimizing the single particle orbitals. That is something that still hasn't quite catch on. Uh, it's not as popular, but in the future, it, I, I believe it will be because it is not so complicated and it can lead to a very powerful improvement of the wave function. And also, it will lead to independence from where you get the, the orbitals from, which is one of the issues that people usually have. On the, on the other piece of the wave function is a bosonic piece, what's called the Jastrow function. This is, is meant, it is uh, written as an exponential, it cannot change the sign of the wave function because the Jastrow is a real quantity. Uh, so it, it mainly, the, the main purpose is to add direct correlation between electrons to the wave function. This is the piece that, for example, quantum chemistry cannot really handle. So here th it's written in a very generic way and it's meant to be as complicated as you are willing to, to make it. Uh, the, the absolute, the standard I would say, the one that by default people would use is you have one term that it correlates, uh, it's really, it's not correlation, it's just a, an electron ion term. So this would depend only on one coordinate of the electron at a time and it's really meant to improve any deficiencies on your, on your basis set basically. If your basis set doesn't have the proper, uh, depend, uh, the proper behavior uh, near a nucleus, then you can add the proper behavior through this function directly. There's the electron-electron piece, which directly correlates two electrons at a time. And this is by far the most important quantity uh, in the Jastro because it, uh, as I will explain, I believe, tomorrow with, with more detail, uh, it takes care of the electron-electron electron cusp condition, which is the idea when two electrons get very close together, the potential energy diverges. So the kinetic energy has to diverge in exactly the same way with the opposite sign to cancel the divergence. Otherwise, you would have problems in your calculation. So this piece takes care of that and also takes care of adding a lot of correlation to the system directly. Uh, in this case, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to say exactly uh, what the variational parameters look like because these are completely undefined functions. You can use a basis set, you can write down some approximate formula like David was talking about before doing RPA, uh, and you can just keep adding terms. You can add terms that correlate three electrons, four electrons, uh, two electrons and an ion, and, and so forth. Uh, but in principle, I mean, anything that you can write down, you can just optimize that way. So at the end of the day, we, we want to have something very specific that we optimize. We want to have a, a cost function. If you're familiar with optimization algorithms, there's always some sort of cost that you have to minimize uh, or maximize for that uh, for, for the ge in the generic case. So like I said, there are two main alternatives. Uh, these, of course, are not the, the only alternatives. Uh, Energy and variance are the, the more straightforward things, I would say, because they come straight out of the uh, variational principle. You can also do things like uh, optimize the overlap of the wave function, like David was mentioning. You can also, instead of doing the variance, you can do generalized norms. Instead of taking the square, you can take the linear, uh, just uh, the distance between uh, the energy and, and, and the mean, for example, instead of taking the square. And, and, and you can do several things like that. As long as you have a, a way of justifying that the minimum of this quantity will lead to the best solution, then you can put it in the cost function. I, in this case, let's just focus on energy and variance for now because this is the, the typical case. Uh, so it is important to realize that for any approximate wave function, the parameters that minimize the energy don't necessarily coincide with the parameters that minimize the variance. So in principle, we really want to minimize the energy. I, I guess there's a little bit of a not everybody would necessarily agree with this, but my perspective and, and the one that I believe is shared by most people is that it's most important to minimize the energy because it takes you closer to the variational uh, principle. Uh, minimizing the energy, on the other hand, it's a little bit harder than minimizing the variance because the variance is positive definite quantity and the energy is not. So uh, for typically in the 90s, in the 90s, it was uh, most algorithms would optimize the variance because it was just uh, simpler. And it kind of requires a little bit less computing time. But over the last five or six years, especially with the introduction of the linear method, now energy minimization is, is standard and it's actually very easy to, to accomplish for most wave functions. Uh, so in, in at the end of the day, as, as you will see in QMC pack, what you actually optimize is any linear combination, including energy, variance, and what's called the unreweighted variance, which I will describe yes, later. So you can make any linear combination of this. So I would suggest for now that uh, including a little bit of the variance is useful because uh, it helps reduce 
uh, mainly the variance of, of the wave function, which leads to smaller error bars. So typically what you do is you take 90 to 90 percent of the energy and, and whatever remains, you put it on the variance, for example. Optimization method. So before, before I say anything about actual optimization, let me define uh, some notation. So before, uh, let's assume that we have some generalized cost, uh, cost function. Uh, you can, for, for, for simplicity, you can just take the cost function as the energy, for example. But I'm going to leave it a little bit more generic. It can be a anything really that you want to put in there. So in order to do optimization, you need to know the gradient and the first, I mean the first derivative and the second derivatives of this cost function. So typically by G, we would uh, call just the generalized gradient of this uh, cost function. And it's just the derivative with respect to a parameter, which again, it's completely generic at this point. You don't, when you're writing, for example, these routines, you don't care where the parameter is coming from. This is just some parameter that you can evaluate the gradient of the cost function. And then you get also your matrix of second derivatives, which is the Hessian. Uh, we will eventually use also information about the derivative directly of the wave function, not just of the local of the total of the cost function. So we, whenever we use a subscript, uh, one subscript means a first derivative of the wave function with respect to a variational parameter, and uh, two subscripts means, of course, the second derivative. So what's the simplest possible algorithm? Well, I guess it's the simplest that you can do to to optimize any, any function in general. Let's forget about Monte Carlo for one second. If you have a, a quantity and you can calculate the force, then moving along the force would eventually get you to the bottom of the hill. So steepest descent is, is typically considered the simplest, most straightforward way of optimizing a uh, quantity. So given a set of variational parameters A, you update the parameters by just adding uh, some fraction of the gradient. Of course, in the negative direction, you want to go down the hill. So this, in general, will converge to a local minima. Uh, the problem is that it will converge quite slowly. If you think about it, since these parameters are completely general, you can have things on the Jastro on with a cubic term next to it, and you can have a linear coefficient in the determinant. The, 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 the way that the energy depends on these two parameters is completely different. You can have a huge second derivative in one and a very small second derivative on the other. So making basically the, the one that varies the most is the one that's going to determine how far along the gradient you can move. So this this typic this steepest descent since it has since it has no information whatsoever about curvature or anything like that, it leads to really slow convergence typically if you have a different parameters that vary on different scales. So in practice, uh, the value of gamma that you need to have a stable algorithm is extremely small, leading to really long, I mean, you need a lot and a lot of iterations to really converge. Uh, the, the useful thing is that it doesn't need Hessians, of course, which are kind of expensive to evaluate. So it, it's, it's simple and it would take you there. So th this algorithm has been tried for, for some time, many years ago, and I mean, in practice, it's not particularly effective. So we try something better. Uh, what about Newton's methods? I mean, if you go in, into your numerical recipes and start looking at optimization methods, typically the Newton method is something that's considered quite useful. Uh, in this case, you need, uh, you, what you tend to do is you expand your wave function to second order and you find the location where the forces go to zero. That would lead to this uh, type of expression where now, I mean, if you remember before, it's just uh, some fraction of the gradient. What do you, what do you add? In this case, what you add is, is a contraction of the Hessian and the gradient. And this uh, effectively, the, if eventually, whenever the potential gets close to being close to quadratic, this would actually take you very close to the minimum in one shot. If it's very far away, then you have to typically uh, use the directions, but find some way to, to, to decide how far down the hill you want to move, given that, that you find a direction along this way. So in this case, the method is a lot more efficient. It, it has information about second derivatives. So it takes care of the fact that some parameters want to move very far, other ones do, do not want to move far at all. Uh, so it, it doesn't have this, this slow convergence problem. Uh, it's typically very hard to implement, and it's actually, don't believe it's even implemented in KMC pack. Uh, the reason is because you have a lot of potential cross terms. So the way we write QMC pack, we want to make it very generic. We, we want to make it in such that if one of you have a new idea on how to implement the wave function, you can go in there and it's completely modular. You would just insert your new evaluation of the wave function inside the code and you don't have to care about everything else in the code. If you implement a method like this, then you would have to implement every possible cross term between what you did and every other type of parameter in the system, which makes 
the calculate, I mean, makes maintaining and developing extremely complicated. So while the Newton method in principle can be effective, it's really hard to, to maintain and implement. Uh, so what has been done in the last, uh, it was 2006, so between uh, eight and six and eight years, was the introduction of the linear method. This is a compromise between the two ideas. This is a compromise between uh, using Hessian informa using information about derivatives in some degree, taking care of the fact that not all parameters want to move equally fast, and not requiring Hessians. So, so staying as close to steep as descent, but being able to handle the difference in the scales. So the idea of the linear method is, is to expand the wave function to linear order in the parameters. So you're doing kind of a Taylor expansion to first order. Uh, so we, we define the linearized wave function now as your original wave function, and by original I mean your wave function given a given set of parameters, plus uh, all linear terms uh, in, in these parameters. The, the psi bar sub i is, again, the derivative of psi bar. The only difference is, is for, uh, for purposes uh, of, uh, for, for I mean, anyway, I'll come back to this later, but basically, you, you define your nor a normalized wave function in this case. So typically when you do Monte Carlo, you really don't care about normalization because the method doesn't, the wave function doesn't need to be normalized. In this case, let's define the wave functions. The, whenever you see a bar, it means that it's, no, it's a normalized wave function. And then you take the, the first order derivative of this wave function, but orthogonalized to your current state. So these side bars are really the component of the wave function along the change of a given parameter that's orthogonal to, to the given wave function. The idea is now that what we want to minimize is the energy of this linearized wave function, which is uh, now will be the minimum of the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian, but now with this, uh, lin uh, this is not mean, sorry, this is supposed to be lean. So with this linear approximation to the wave function. Uh, with a little bit of algebra, and if you're more interested, you can go to the original paper in the it's a JCP by Julian Toulouse and Cyrus Ombrigar, where they, where they go into a lot of detail about this. If you take, uh, if you solve the system, you eventually go to a generalized eigenvalue problem, where h bar is a ma the matrix elements of your Hamiltonian between your uh, your linearized uh, derivatives, uh, your, sorry, your orthogonalized derivatives, and actually goes from zero to n. N would be the number of parameters. Zero would be you have to include the original wave function in in this set, uh, and the overlap matrix, which is just would be the overlap of all of these orthogonalized derivatives. You can show that the lowest uh, solution to this generalized eigenvalue problem would give you a direction of descent of the energy that takes into account the fact that different parameters vary in different ways. Because it's, it's effectively the overlap matrix takes care of the fact of how much and how far away the, 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 the two parameters, uh, the wave function gets as you vary two parameters. So these two matrices are in, of, I mean, the number of optimization parameters plus one, like I said. And they're just matrix elements on this basis of orthogonalized derivatives, where you have your original wave function first, and then just a list of all the linearized derivatives. I want to mention how you actually evaluate the gradient and the Hessian and these overlap matrices in BMC. The idea, I mean, in principle, this can any both the Newton method and the linearized method uh, and the linear method could be used. It depends on which one is implemented. Uh, for example, Cyrus is, is a big proponent also of the Newton method, and his code champ would have this implemented for some particular uh, parameters on the wave function. Uh, so now what we have to do is uh, we're doing, we, we need to devise a, a way of evaluating these derivatives. The typical way that the optimization cycle would go is I, I have some set of parameters. I mean, let's say you, need, you start with zero and, and then you want to, to go from there. You do a variational calculation and you accumulate the gradients or the Hessians if you're doing the Newton method. And uh, you do a long enough calculation so that you have some reasonable statistics on these two quantities. And you use the previous, uh, one of the three previous methods to iterate your parameters in the wave function. Then you go back, you repeat your variational calculation with the new parameters, and you estimate a new gradient. And you keep going until your wave function converges. The derivative of the local energy, the, the gradients that we introduced before, uh, I did put the equations. I, I didn't want to go through the derivation. It's, it's not hard to realize that. So in hi inside here, we have the expression for the energy. So we, we just need to take a derivative with respect to any parameter. So we have to remember that the parameters exist both on, pa on the distribution and also on the local energy. Uh, 
for example, the first term, which is just uh, would look like the average of the, so by average in this case, I mean integral over this pi distribution. Uh, you can see that if you just take the derivative of the pi, it was psi squared, so it would be two times psi over, uh, two times psi, yes. Numerically, so the derivatives are analytic. The, the derivatives of the wave function are analytic. The derivative of the energy are numerical. So you have to do a variational calculation to calculate this quantity because you would get the energy and its derivatives directly from the same sample when you are doing the VMC. But the estimator, what you accumulate during the simulation, contains only analytic terms. So it's, it's an average over something analytic, but done stochastically. Uh, I don't know if you can, if it's clear the distinction. So of course, uh, in QMC pack, they're analytic, depends on which code you're using. So many codes actually don't have analytic derivatives for everything because they get somewhat involved. The Jastro is one case. I, people might correct me. I believe that QMC pack is the only code that has analytical derivatives of the Jastro uh, for a generalized, uh, you know, expansion of your, of your, of your Jastro function, of your backflow functions they actually get quite involved. And I'm, I'm not aware of anyone having this on their code. Uh, in practice, uh, if, if you don't have the, the analytical derivatives, then, then you have to numerically evaluate the derivatives of the wave function and of the local energy during the process, uh, during the simulation. As, as it stands, if you, if you can write down the analytical derivatives, then to get the gradient, so in this case, it's the gradient of the BMC energy, uh, then you just have to accumulate a term that, that looks like this, where uh, again, this is, this is, in a sense, the gradient of the logarithm of the wave function. I, I chose to, to write it like this. Uh, whenever there's nothing, this is meant to be the wave function at the current set of parameters. So like I was saying, the first term, you get a factor of two, mainly the gradient of psi squared would be two times psi. Uh, two times the gradient of psi times psi. So you multiply it and divide by psi, you get back your psi squared, and then you keep on the estimator the, the gradient divided by the wave function. Of course, this, this you need to divide because you need to recover back uh, the original distribution, which is what defines the average. So th the first derivative, the derivative of this term would lead to this term. The derivative of the denominator would lead to the other term. It's not so hard to realize. Uh, if you realize there is no direct derivative of the local energy, there's nothing in here that takes the gradient of the local energy and, and keeps it in the average. And that's because you can show uh, that the gradient, the, 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 the gr basically the, the derivative of any local operator with respect to any parameter in the wave function average over the VMC distribution is zero. So that sounded a little bit confusing. It boils down to, to this for the energy. If you just average the, and I did not define what this is, so sorry, e, e L comma I is the derivative of the local energy with respect to a given parameter I. And in this case, the local energy, meaning the one that gets average over, if you average over the entire distribution, it, this would have to be zero, exactly. So in any given actual, in any given sample, if you just have, you know, 10,000 steps of a VNC cal calculation, and you average this, it it's doesn't have to be zero. It would be zero within error bars. So instead of adding this extra variational, uh, you know, error, uh, statistical error in the evaluation of the gradients, you just use the fact that you, you know it has to be zero and you just leave it away, take, uh, remove it. The second derivative would follow, uh, the derivation would follow th the same type of derivation. You would just take a new derivative of this guy and then you get second derivatives. For example, when you take the derivative of this guy, which leads here, then you, and, and you can, uh, I mean, this would be a nice exercise for you if you want. Uh, you can derive that this is the form that it has to take. If you, if you do this like this, you actually only get one of these terms. Uh, Cyrus and Julien showed on this paper that you can actually symmetrize this derivative and reduce the errors considerably. Uh, because a every time that, if you, if you were to consider only the first term and we forget about this, the fluctuations of, the, of this quantity are very large. But you can show that if you write them as a covariance, meaning the, the, the fluctuation minus its average is actually much more suitable and uh, at the end of the day, it should give you the same answer in the limit where you sample long enough. So in, in QMC pack, if you go inside the, the, the guts of the code, you would see that all of these uh, estimators are ev uh, evaluated whenever you're doing a v, uh, an optimization calculation. And then with the results of these two things, you can use the previous steps and move the parameters along the way. Oh, I, I did define the derivative of the local energy, sorry. I didn't notice that. 
Okay, so for the linear method, we need two more quantities, which in the same way you can write down in terms of uh, the local energy, the gradients of the wave function, and in the case of the full overlap, you also need this term that has the derivative of the local energy itself. So in the same way that we would calculate the gradient in the past, we would do a VMC calculation with a given set of parameters, and during the calculation, we just accumulate all of these quantities. Uh, you can see that this, is, this, this, this would be just a gradient, and this is just a very closely related. Uh, notice that the, th this H matrix is not symmetric. Uh, so for example, the, the I zero term is not the same as the zero I term. You, you have an extra term in here. You can show, and again, this is a very important paper if you want to learn about optimization. You, you should really read it if you're interested. You can show that the fact that this wave function is non-symmetric leads to a lot smaller variances. In this case, the, one of the reasons why optimizing the energy has been so problematic in the past is because the fluctuations of, the, of these quantities, in particular the, the fluctuations of this guy, are, are very large if you, don't do, if you don't use the proper estimators. So with very large fluctuations, you need really long VMC calculations to get the, the Hessian with small letter bars. If you don't have small letter bars, then you're kind of the, the, the directions where you move into your Newton method are influenced significantly by noise, so it would effectively fail to converge in most, ca in most cases, actually. Uh. So the only, the different term is the derivative at this guy, yeah. But on the previous slide, um, that was defined as zero, maybe? Uh, that is true. So, and if you're Yeah, so in principle, this would be zero, so we would kick it out, yeah. So for example, this is the, the non-symmetric term, actually. So if you realize you have an ij, but you don't have a ji. So it, I, I brought this by mistake. Yeah, in principle, this would be zero, and we wouldn't really accumulate it. Uh, but in this case, you can see that this term is symmetric in ij. This term is symmetric because you have this term. And then this term is symmetric in ij. This guy is not. So you have the derivative of parameter i in the wave function and parameter j in the local energy. You don't have the opposite term. If you introduce the opposite term, uh, you actually get a much larger uh, variance on, on the final calculation. And actually, the, the derivation of this goes back to Peter Nightingale, and it's like 95 or something like that. Anyway, so if you're really interested, let me know, and, and, and I can point you to the right papers. So for, for now, especially if you think about the linear method, we have linearized the wave function away from, from the current place where we are. So in the immediate neighborhood of the wave function, this gives you a good direction to move. It tells you which uh, vector to use in this parameter space to find uh, your, 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 your next move. It's not so good at telling you how far along this, this vector you have to move. Because as soon as you get far away from the current set of positions, the wave function is not really linear. So it, it, it doesn't really know how to move uh, whenever it gets too far away. What there are three different alternatives that people have used. So in the very original paper, if you go back to the 2008 original paper by Cyrus, uh, what they do is they, they, they try to do something like a, either they use a fixed time step, and then you just move a, a certain amount of distance given along this direction that the linear method would give you. Or you try, he actually tried to, to, to derive some scaling relations between the different types of parameters. So he would rescale the, the gradient of the jazz throw in, in a certain way and would rescale the, the, the linear derivatives in another slightly different way to try to optimize how far along you have to move along these parameters. Uh, this is possible in QMC FAC, although I, I wouldn't really recommend it because the convergence depends very strongly on, on the system and on the wave function. And then you would really need to know what to do and, and what to, to move around to get this working. The best way instead is just to do a quick linear uh, one-dimensional line minimization problem along this set of uh, directions in parameter space. So there are two ways of doing this. You can, uh, so I the, the simplest, most naive way would be to repeat VMC calculations along three, four, five points along this, this path, and then just fit some sort of polynomial. This, will, of course, would imply that every time you want to move, you have to do several VMC calculations, which is not really optimal. So what we do is, uh, once you choose this direction, we do correlated sampling. Uh, I, we haven't discussed correlated sampling, I realize. So the idea of correlated sampling is if you have a, actually, I do. So let's, let's step back one second and, and discuss very briefly what reweighting is. 
Uh, the idea of reweighting is, oh, sorry, so at first this is the general equation for Monte Carlo integration. In Monte Carlo we want to do a numerical integral and if we can write the integral like this where the integral over g is 1, g is normalized, then you can show that by sampling points on this distribution you can obtain the, 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 the full and a, and a good approximation to the integral by just averaging over f over points that are distributed according to g. So distributed according to g means that if you take the probability of any given point being on this set is equal to the, the value of g at that point. Uh, so, uh, and, and then given a way of sampling points from g, then you can just average directly f. And you know that the exact solution has to be within uh, some normal distribution given by, by this, this, this. You, have, you have seen this already in the first day. So what happens if I have a given function g and I already did a sample? I have 100,000 points evaluated at this value of g, but what I really want to know is the value of the wave function. So what's, what's the value of the integral, but now for a g that's slightly different? In principle, the simplest thing is just to redo the whole thing and then sample g prime. But there is a way of reusing the fact that you already sample points in a nearby distribution uh, to calculate the integral of, the, of to calculate this new integral based on a slightly different g, and it's called reweighting. The idea is that you take all the original points, but now you you take care of the fact that the real distribution you're sampling is g prime, it's not g. So if this is the wave function, if this is the integral that you really want to calculate, you can multiply and divide by g, for example and then get back an, an integral that it's over this original g distribution, but what you estimate, what you accumulate, the, the, the new f function would be slightly different. It would have these weights that take care of the, of the ratio of the fact that it's really with respect to g prime that you want to do the integral. And then you can show that everything else follows sm uh, smoothly. And then the average would just be accumulation over this new function. So uh, th this, I think it was mentioned before by David, this is, this is a way of if in the, concept, in the context of optimization, let's say that I already have a sample with a given set of parameters, and I just want to know what's the energy if I move the parameters just a little bit away from where I am. Instead of having to do an entirely new BMC calculation, what I can do is take the energy expression and all of the points that I had done previously and calculate the reweighted energy at the new set of parameters, and th then observe how the energy changes as a function of, of where the parameters are and try to minimize the wave function this way. So, uh, before moving on, and this was already mentioned by David, the idea of reweighting only works in the limit where these two distributions are qualitatively similar. If the distributions are completely different, then the samples I generated with G are completely unrelated to what the good samples from G prime would be. The efficiency would drop to zero. What this would mean, and th the efficiency can be written like this, and these Ws are just these ratios of, of the Gs, what this would mean is that in the limit where I move far away, if I originally had, let's say, 100,000 steps uh, or, or points on my sample, when my new distribution moves, moves too far away, I effectively don't have 100,000. I effectively, in the limit where it's really far, just have a very small number of samples. And in the limit where they're completely unrelated, I just have a single sample, which is really a terrible, I would have terrible statistics for my reweighted calculation. So any calculate any, any time uh, that we want to do reweighting, we have to pay close attention to what's the effective number of walkers that you really have, because effectively the error on this reweighted energy would be terrible. Uh, so going back to, to the optimization problem now, instead of repeating VMC calculations along this path that the linear method is telling me to move on, what we actually do is we choose three or four parameters, and uh, we actually choose four, five actually, and we do uh, reweighting evaluation of the energy along these five points, and we fit a, quint a quartic function to this. And we try to move uh, to, the, to the minimum of this quartic function. Uh, this is one way, this is the, the default if you don't do anything. Uh, the if, of course, this can be problematic if the wave function is really complicated or for some reason, typically this would happen if the set of parameters that you have is really, really poor, then, then this, this method would not really work. Uh, you would get a, the point that the, the, the fit tells you to move is just completely off uh, where you should be. So what you typically do in this case is just do a direct line minimization. And by this I mean uh, like with numerical recipes. You, you take a point that's far away that you know it's beyond the minimum and you can, there, are, there are ways of, of making sure that you have crossed the minimum. And then you start looking for a minimum somewhere in between these two points. Uh, you can use the golden ratio, for example, and bisection, for example, if you're familiar. 
this is a very uh, robust way of doing this. And for the absolute worst wave functions, this would still work. It, it would be slightly slower, but you can set it and, and it would get the job done. I mean, in my case, I have tried things that uh, are extremely hard to, to optimize. And as soon as I set this line minim direct line minimization, uh, eventually it, it just gets there without that much trouble, without that my intervention, I should say. So it's quite robust. So back to QMC pack specific. So in QMC pack, uh, before uh, saying anything, by, by far the linear method is the recommended setting and it's actually the only one I'm going to discuss. So we also have conjugate gradients and, and several other algorithms, but the linear method is by far the most stable. So for, for practical purpose, just assume that it's the only one that's there. Uh, it, like I said, it's very robust. It can handle all type of parameters. Uh, Efficiently depends on which parameters you're talking about, but it gets the job done, which is the important thing, with very little human intervention. And it's actually quite fast, meaning you don't need Hessians, you only need first derivatives. These derivatives are analytic, so the evaluation of the, the extra evaluation, the extra time due to the evaluation of these derivatives is almost zero. And, uh, and it, it works. So it, this is a typical uh, flowchart of what a, an optimization calculation would be. So first of all, you generate uh, samples. This you, you would have to look through this. Uh, you generate, you do a BMC calculation, and you would generate a, a sample of configurations. So remember in the past that I said that, uh, in principle, what you need to do is you need to run BMC and evaluate the gradients, for example, if you want to do steepest descent, uh, or the overlap and the Hamiltonian matrix if you want to do the linear method. So in principle, we can do the evaluation of these quantities directly in the VMC calculation. We choose not to do this. Uh, and I would say why now. But what we do is, instead of doing the evaluation directly during the VMC, we just save in a file configurations. And we're going to evaluate these quantities on these configurations that we saved in the file. Uh, the idea is you want to save configurations roughly at the same rate as your system is decorrelating. So you, you want to get some idea of how, what's the correlation length of your system, and then you want to produce samples at this rate. Uh, and, and I would say how to do this uh, now, uh, sorry, in, in a little bit. So once you do your VMC calculation that's inside your optimization step, then you actually read back the configurations that you write, and then you actually optimize the energy on these configurations. The reason why we want to generate configurations instead of directly calculating the, op the, the quantities here is because we can actually loop internally with a fixed set of configurations, uh, the linear method, several times. This is useful in, in some cases, uh, and, and, and so, so, so we leave it as an option. Uh, and it's, it's consistent with the way uh, optimization was done before the linear method was, was introduced. In that case, uh, you would typically just generate a sample and optimize the energy on this sample, and you would typically never change the sample. So uh, this allows you to have two loops in the system. One, internally looping uh, with the fixed set of configurations, and the other one, whenever you, uh, you can go back and regenerate configurations and repeat the, the, same pro this, the whole process uh, again and again. So once you have a, a, gener a sample of configurations, you load those configurations, calculate your matrices, and solve the generalized eigenvalue problem. It's actually quite straightforward. Uh, then once you have the direction where you want the parameters to move, you do a linear el el minimization along this direction, a 1D minimization. Uh, by default, like I said, you either you use a quartic fit. If you don't set anything in the code, it would by default try to do this quartic fit with reweighting. Uh, even if the problem is particularly hard, and typically a hard problem would be if you have way too many parameters. Uh, if you're optimizing a wave function with you know, 5,000 determinants, and that can be done, then you typically would have to do something like line minimization, direct line minimization, instead of this quartic fit. But you do one of these two, and then you go, when, when you're done with this step, you can either go back and generate calculations again and do it again, or you can just go out and, and use the wave function, for example, to, use, to do VMC or, or DMC. Uh, tomorrow in the tutorial, and I believe today also, you would see a lot more about the actual optimization block. So, th so this would be uh, my default. In 90% in of my calculations, I don't even look at the input anymore. I literally have a file with this saved somewhere, and I just use it. Uh, the only thing that you have to change, I, I mainly change two things. So uh, since, since we are short in time, I'm not going to go into all the specifics. In the, tr in the tutorials that you do in the afternoon, you would actually see what all these features are. 
uh, very short, you have, like I, like I said, the first thing that you do is you generate parameters and then you use those parameters to actually do the optimization. So the VMC block is embedded directly into the optimization block. You have this loop outside. This would be the outer loop. You can repeat the process as many times as you want. And every time you go into the loop, you start with a VMC calculation be with a before actually optimizing. This is how you de define the cost function. So in this case, I said this is what I really recommend, something like 95% of energy and 5% of reweighted variance. And maybe tomorrow I'll say more about this. And then you have uh, some tags that define how you actually want to to do the optimization. Like I said, the important concept here is that other than changing the number of samples, which is the only thing that you really have to think about when you're doing the calculation, the code is very robust. If you just take this, 95% of the time this would work straight ahead. I mean, this would work without modification. And this very quickly, uh, it's meant to show that the method is it's robust and it works actually quite efficiently. This is work from uh, seminal paper, a very important paper written a few years ago by the main people involved in developing these methods. I mean, it's Andrew Sorella and Cyrus Umbregard and company. And where they show that you can optimize uh, systems that in the past, past had been somewhat problematic to optimize with a very small number of iterations. So you start basically from a hard fox solution with no Jastro and anything, and in a handful of steps, you can converge very quickly uh, to, to a scale of a few millihartry. The other thing that's important is if you want to optimize now everything together in the wave function, Jastro, CSF, orbitals, anything that you want to throw in there and you have a few thousand variation of parameters, you can do this without, with no problem at all. And you can get a systematic reduction of the energy as a function of how many, for example, configuration state functions you're including both for VMC and DMC. And this is, would be a, a very nice way to reach in very, very, very accurate solutions. And tomorrow I would go into a lot of detail on how to do this and, and what this means. So I, you, you have access to the lecture notes if you're interested in this. And there's a lot of history in optimization. This is a very small sample of the most important papers that ha have led to the, to the linear method that we have implemented in the code. So you can go back and you can ask any of the developers uh, and we would gladly talk to you about this in detail. Thank you. <laughs>